Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Breast Cancer Now's Facebook Live this evening. I'm Catherine. I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists in the nursing team. And tonight I'm joined by one of my newer colleagues, Katie. So welcome, Katie, to Facebook Live. Um, this evening we're going to be having a, a question and answer session, a Q&A session on secondary breast cancer. So just remember, Anything that you want to ask, you can, and we'll try and answer that in the in the time that we've got. If we don't manage to answer your question this evening, and we've got a few to sort of kick starters uh, before we go in and looking at your comments and your posts um, this evening, then um, I will get round to answering those tomorrow. So no question will go unanswered totally. Um, so we'll be able to write uh, an answer to those that we don't manage to, uh, to talk about this evening. Uh, so do remember that they're public posts. So anything that you post, everybody else will be able to see. So if there's anything that is a little bit intimate, you don't want to share with other people, but you do want to ask us a question, then there's loads of ways to get in touch with us here at Breast Cancer Now, the nursing team. We have our helpline on 0808 800 6000. We've got our Ask Our Nurses email service. So you can find that on the website. You can ask us questions questions via the uh, website discussion forums and then any way you please privately on social media so Twitter, Instagram and Facebook so do get hold of us even if there is something that you don't want to ask publicly this evening but please post your comments and questions this evening and as I say we'll try and answer them. Um, so the helpline is open tomorrow I will say and uh, up to Friday nine till four every day weekdays and on a Saturday nine till one. So I think uh, we need to sort of get going. Um, Katie, you're going to be asking me the questions that we've got already. So welcome to Facebook Live. Do you want to kick off by giving me a first question, please? Absolutely. Yeah. So we've had a few questions in already. And I think a good well, place to, um, to start really is a question from Sophie. Um, and she's asking, actually, what is secondary breast cancer? Uh, well, that is a good place to start, isn't it, given that we've got a Q&A about secondary breast cancer. So secondary breast cancer is when early breast cancer, so that's cancer that starts in the breast, spreads beyond the breast and beyond the lymph nodes that are under the arm. OK, so this can happen via uh, the bloodstream, the cells escaping through the bloodstream or through the lymphatic system. And this is then called secondary breast cancer because it sets up other cancers in other areas of the body because those cells can move. So typically those areas might be the bones, the lungs, the liver, the brain. It can happen anywhere, but those are the typical ones, the very common ones. Um, there are other types of breast cancer that might, uh, or types of breast cancer that might mean that somebody's secondary breast cancer actually happens elsewhere um, or particular places. So for instance, for those who've had a lobular breast cancer, we often find that if people get secondary breast cancer after a, a lobular primary breast cancer, then they get it in the um, abdomen sort of area around the ovaries and the stomach and the bowel, those sorts of those sorts of areas. And what we know about secondary breast cancer is that it's treatable, but it's not curable. And people might hear it called we use secondary breast cancer in the UK quite a lot. And certainly as an organisation, but metastatic breast cancer, secondaries, met stage four, all of those things describe what I've just described, what secondary breast cancer is. Same different names same meaning yeah excellent and and you mentioned the fact that um secondary breast cancer isn't curable um and that's actually there's a there's a lady somebody that's posted and they haven't left their name but they've actually asked the question why why is secondary cancer not curable okay. and I think that's a quite a tricky question to answer it's, it's a really difficult question to answer simply so a lot of people will have had primary breast cancer before they've developed secondary breast cancer. We know that there is a group of people who actually secondary breast cancer is there right at the right from the start. They may have been diagnosed with a primary and secondary right at the, at the same time. For some people, actually, they know about their secondary before their primary. But if you've had treatment for primary breast cancer, that treatment aims to reduce your chance of the breast cancer coming back in the future. So things like the targeted treatments like Herceptin, chemotherapy and the um, hormone treatments all aim to reduce that risk. Everybody's risk will be very different. All cancers um, are different. And those treatments work by killing any stray cancer cells that might be floating through the lymphatic system, the blood system. OK, 
if there are any of those cells that are left behind in the blood system, then they are then free to go elsewhere in the body and set up those uh, secondary cancers. And so although we can never say anybody is absolutely cured, and I'm sure lots of people out there, even if they don't have a diagnosis of secondary breast cancer, have been told we can never say for sure that we've cured you, the vast majority of people won't have um, a problem um, at all. What we're able to say about people that do develop secondary breast cancer, though, unfortunately, is that those cells have obviously been able to have been left untreated or they haven't been actually, you know, they haven't been treated by the chemotherapy. They haven't been killed off by the chemotherapies. They're left there to be, and they can develop secondaries. Um, and what we're able to say is that if we, we find one area of secondary breast cancer, then the probability is that although there's one area to be seen, there's likely to be more elsewhere. And this is where it becomes tricky because quite a lot of people say to us, well, why can't you just remove it from the lung or the liver? But the likelihood is even if you remove that, then there is else something else lurking elsewhere, if you like. Lots of new treatments have made such a difference to people's outcome with having primary breast cancer and treatment that can keep secondary breast cancer under control as well. But the other thing that we've learned over the many, well, I was gonna say maybe the last decade, probably more than that in the time that I've been interested in breast cancer is that we know that cells actually alter themselves. They develop in order to um, be able to escape, if you like, being treated by the chemotherapies. So it's, um, um, that means that people do actually progress, that those, those cells actually manage to um, avoid being treated, they avoid being killed off, and they actually um, you know, change themselves as things, as, 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 as time progresses. So that's why people find that their cancer progresses because those cells are not being treated anymore by those by those treatments. I'm giving you an awful lot of words here and going round, but it's really so tricky they, to understand. Um, so they don't respond to some of the treatments. So they don't suppose, respond to yeah. some of it, or they evade treatment, as it were. Yeah. And that carries on and on and on. And obviously, then different treatments are are introduced, and the cells change again, and so on and so forth. Um, why do they stop working? Well, we're not really sure, to be honest, why, you know, we why those cells are able to be able to do that sort of thing. But that's part of a lot of the research that is, you know, hap is happening. And particularly those that uh, we support research that we support through Breast Cancer Now is is um, is seeking to understand, because if you can understand how those cells behave and how they, um, you know, how they manage to do that, then we would be better in a position to be able to try and develop new treatments. So finding out how breast cancer spreads and how treatments work and how we can stop those, uh, you know, those that, ev that evasion of treatment is really important if we're going to be able to make sure that people live and live well with their secondary breast cancer to be able to halt that. So I don't know whether that totally answers your question, whoever it was that answers, answered it, but I've always found it really difficult to answer. So hopefully that gives you some sort of idea. It's, it is a progressive type disease and it's not possible always to be able to, to, to treat all of those cells. Okay, and, and sort of going along that line a little bit more, would you be able to tell us sort of... Um, when secondary cancer occurs is there a timeline that people would um would expect that to happen um i think again that that can that can vary hugely so there will be some people who have quite a lot of uh, you know quite um uh high risk shall we say disease so quite a lot of people might ask about what their prognosis looks like and that they've got a higher risk of their breast cancer coming back. For some people that might happen quite soon because the treatments that have been used have not worked. They haven't killed their cells off as I was explaining before. For some people it might actually be many, many years later. So it's not unusual for us to hear from people who say actually I was 10, 12 years down the line. But many people also speak to us and, and come back to us and say I've now got a secondary breast cancer diagnosis three four five years so actually you know that time frame is is huge yeah. and that means that we need to be telling people always to be able to look out for the signs and symptoms of any type of recurrence but including secondary breast cancer um for, for as long as for as long as they live really just to be on the lookout and be be aware of what those signs and symptoms are and who they need to report them to
Okay. The, I know we have some other questions that have already come through, but that just leads on quite nicely to a question that Tracy's just posted actually about how would you how would she know if secondary breast cancer is developing? So I thought it might be worth answering that and then I'll go back to the ones that we've already had if that's okay. Sure. So really there are some common signs and symptoms, but if you remember when I said about where secondary breast cancer can develop, then actually it can develop everywhere um, anywhere. So we've got thing, you know, but I did mention the common um, areas, so the bones, liver, lungs, brain. So it's pretty unusual for people to first present with brain secondaries but if we think about the other things then bone bone secondaries are very common so people might get pain pain that's particularly worse at um, night rather than during the day it's persistent gnawing type pain thinking about the liver then people may feel a real fullness they may feel that some pressure underneath their ribs they might feel sick they may become jaundiced so that's a yellowing of the skin with a, a buildup um, of the, the bile pigments in the skin those sorts of things thinking about the lungs then people might be breathless they might develop a cough those sorts of things. So there is a great there's a loads of information on the website there are some great PDFs um, and infographics about the typical signs and symptoms of secondary breast cancer. But what we'd say is the bottom line is if there's something new and it's persistent and you can't explain that there's not an obvious cause for that, then do get it checked out. There are loads of reasons why people might have aches and pains and feeling sick and, you know, having a cough and those sorts of things. But it's also always really a good idea to to report those and and if you're going to your GP after all that time tell them and remind them that you've had a breast cancer diagnosis if that's yeah. what's happened to you tell them that you've remind them you've had a breast cancer diagnosis so have a look at the signs and symptoms Tracy if you can find them on the website hopefully we'll be able to post them actually in the feed um, and you'll be able to see those so hopefully that answers your question there's Thanks. there are many other symptoms yeah you know lots of but those are the sort of common but really it's the take home if there's something new and it's persistent absolutely and you're worried about it to tell yeah. somebody yeah. yeah yeah and always give us a we get loads of calls don't we on the helpline about people yeah. being worried so you can always ring and chat that through yeah. with us and it's perfectly uh, natural isn't it to be worried yeah. about things yeah. so people nobody's going to yeah, to, people think yeah. they're wasting doctor's time no. and things like that, but there's no such thing. I know everybody's so, so busy, but it's really important to report anything that's new and persistent. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. Um, so there's another question here. And again, there wasn't a name for this one, but um, it was how does a low grade primary cancer, I, I, does a low grade primary cancer mean I won't get secondary cancer? I wish I could say that that the answer to that was yes. It means it's less likely. Mm. Having said that, the grade of a cancer is one of many things that would dictate somebody's risk. So the size of the cancer, whether it's hormone dependent, whether it's HER2 positive, whether it's none of those things and it's triple negative. But having a low grade primary breast cancer usually means that you've got less of a chance. But low risk, unfortunately, doesn't mean no risk. So we would always say to somebody to keep in mind that list of signs and symptoms whether they've had a low grade cancer or a high grade cancer everyone's risk is different as i've already said um, and so it's really important that everybody knows the signs and symptoms to look out for thanks catherine um and this um so steph has asked there's not much about um skin um breast cancer spread why why is that why do we not hear much about it spreading to the skin um, there is information out there. I mean, it's we don't often speak to that many people that ring us about um, their skin being affected. So getting skin metastases. But I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that actually do experience this. We've definitely got some information on our website about cancer, that, uh, secondary breast cancer that affects the skin and about the types of treatments. There is particular treatment that can keep that under control in the same way as we control uh, secondary breast cancer elsewhere. The treatment that's given for, for uh, skin metastases called electrochemotherapy. So if you've never heard of that and you've got skin metastases, it's worth a look up. So I don't know why there's more. I think it maybe it's because it's less common, but that doesn't mean to say that we should have any less information, information. about that because yeah. there will be a proportion of people um, ha, ha, you know, experiencing that. But less common than the, the 
the bones live a lung and brain that I think I think I'll stand corrected on that if somebody's going to tell me something different so Steph I, if you need information you can always give us a ring if this is something that affects you and certainly have a look at the website and I think Macmillan and Cancer Research UK have also got information as as well on there so if you need some support and information about that give us a call on the helpline absolutely or email us as well because yeah. we might be able to give you some information there that you could have sort of to look at as well if yeah you, if that's where you yeah. like to get your information yeah. the treatment electrochemotherapy that i mentioned is um, available in particular centers um so quite often people will be referred to those centers even if they're somewhere somewhere else so sort of in a regional mm. center and it's usually the oncologist that would refer you although interestingly it's a surgeon that would carry out that type of treatment but you can read more on the website yeah um, so the next question I have is, um, um, could you give us a little bit of information about letrozole um, and um, switching from tamoxifen? Um, so this is from Wendy, who um, has um, had an oophorectomy and they're talking about switching her medication from tamoxifen to letrozole. OK, so this isn't really about secondary breast cancer. This would be more, I think is it uh, or is it um do we know whether she doesn't mention that it's about secondary cancer no she's, okay she's, yeah so, so i, I mean more general okay so some people might have their hormone therapy switched from one to another if they have secondary breast cancer for the same reason that i described earlier that you know their their, their cancer is progressing and that they're going to try a different hormone therapy so that is a possibility i think possibly what she's describing is changing her from did you say letrozole to tamoxifen <laughs> Um, from tamoxifen to electrosol, sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so if she's had an oophorectomy, I suppose that would be because of she's probably gone through, we're sort of gone through the menopause. I am assuming. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So quite a lot of women who are, um, well, women who are premenopausal, if they we need to give them a, a hormone therapy, then that would be tamoxifen. But if they become postmenopausal because they have either either temporarily because they have something that stops their ovaries working, or they permanently have their ovaries removed, obviously that's a permanency, mm -hmm. then that can push them in, that will push them into the menopause and letrozole becomes a more available letrozole has a tiny little bit along with its other two sort of sister tablets if you like has a tiny little bit of better advantage but can only be given to postmenopausal women some people are switched between hormone therapies when they're on for for their primary breast cancer and that's also usual but that will differ from person to person so i'd always say to check with your team and ask it's always reasonable to ask the rationale as to why things are happening rather than somebody saying to you we're going to do this always ask the reasoning behind that it will help you understand stand and cope better with with the, the changes that are happening to your treatment thank you thank you that's um yeah very thorough there i'd say um and i've got a question here from antoinette who has asked why does her two positive breast cancer tend to go to the brain more than other types of breast cancer i don't know the answer to that antoinette yeah. i don't i think that's you know we need to sort of research we need that research behind us don't we to be able to to know whether the fact that it, it sort of does affect the brain. What we do know about treatment using HER2 directed therapies, so that's anything that we would give to people who've got HER2 positive breast cancer. So things like Herceptin, Pertuzumab, and there are other ones that I can't remember off the top of my head now, just because I'm on the spot. But um, that those sorts of things don't, they're, although they treat the, the, the body, so they, we call them systemic treatments, as I mentioned earlier on, what they don't do and can't do is pass what we call the blood brain barrier. So that yes. means that usually they can't get to the, the, the brain to treat any cancer cells that might be there. So I'm sure there is a reason why specific types of breast cancer go to specific areas. I don't know the answer behind that, but I do know it's quite common for people to present if they've had HER2 positive breast cancer, that it's quite common for them to present maybe with brain metastases on their own because the rest of the body has been treated, treated, treated with well yeah. with the great treatments that we have but actually the brain hasn't been able to be treated and if there's breast cancer cells there and they've been allowed to grow that's when they mm -hmm. when they happen. Well, I think that does answer the question to to some degree there Catherine. So. Uh, well I think I think there is that there is a reason I think she's right yeah. I'm pretty sure I've heard that her two positive breast cancer is I don't know whether it's more common or whether it just tends to present in the same way as we know that triple negative does as well. Yeah. Um, so there might be a, a mingling of those two things in there. Yeah. 
Um, Gail has asked if you can get secondary cancer after having DCIS stage one. So she's had um, uh, she's had her boob taken away, so a mastectomy, and then she had tamoxifen for five years. But it sounds like it was DCIS, and she's asking if she can have secondary breast cancer after that. Okay, so in theory, DCIS would be is is a type not in theory. DCIS is a type of very early breast cancer where breast cancer cells are confined to the milk ducts. The ducts that are in the breast, where the milk that is made in the lobes of the, the uh, breast travel down to the nipples so that a woman can feed a baby. And whether she does or she doesn't, she has that anatomy and that those cancer cells start but are confined. So it's a bit like keeping them in a, a sealed tube, if you like. What we know about invasive breast cancers, and they are the ones that tend to have the ability to spread, are those are the ones that have been able to get out of that tube. They've been able to get out of the milk duct. So the theory would be if somebody purely has DCIS, DCIS, then they would, their, their, you know, their, their prognosis, their outlook looks really very good because in theory, those cells can't travel. They've been kept in one place, then they've been removed. Um, and there's nothing left. It's still important to make sure that you've removed all of that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will have a recurrence in that breast, having had, I know that Gail said that she's had her breast removed, but some people will have a lumpectomy for um, DCIS, uh, DCIS as well. And if they get a recurrence, maybe that has become invasive and that would then put them at risk of developing secondary breast cancer. But if you have purely DCIS, then the chance of that is negligible in presuming that there was no sort of invasive disease there in the first place. Yeah, because it hasn't got yeah. the ability to go anywhere else. Yeah. So therefore, yeah, it's yeah. um it's confined to those breast ducts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And if you want any more information about DCIS and what that is, then obviously there's information on the website and we've got a great booklet about DCIS as well. So yeah. Yeah. Um, Becky has asked, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in now, which is great. So um Becky yeah. has asked about um is there any evidence of taking Pabocyclib and Letrozole indefinitely? She said, so it she, sounds like she was diagnosed five years ago um, and she's been told that her cancer is incurable, but because it's five years, she's feeling hopeful. And how long, I suppose she's asking is how long hmm. can she take the Pabocyclib and Letrozole? Okay, so uh, with any treatment, and I think we can say that for any treatment rather than just the Pabocyclib and Letrozole, but these are quite new treatments, the Pabocyclib, Ribocyclib, and Bemocyclib. So three, three drugs that are very, very similar. And um, a lot of people are doing very, very well on those. They have to be given with Letrozole um, mm. or one of the hormone um, therapies, but usually Letrozole. Um, and that means that people are hormone um, receptor positive uh, type breast cancer that you can give those to. But as I said before, then many of the cells or the cells learn to be able to escape treatment, if you like, and evade treatment. So the partnership of actually of letrozole and palbocyclib appears to mean that people will stay on them, those types of treatment for much, much longer. It seems that they that it stops those um, the cells becoming resistant much sooner. I think that's the way that I would put it. But equally, there are other people who are on things like HER2 therapies, like the cad -Sila, um, and those sorts of things who have been on those types of treatment for a long, long time. So there are a good number of people, even though they're not written down in academic papers. And this is the problem with us I'm going on to slightly veering off here onto um, us collecting numbers about how many people do have secondary breast cancer, both here in the UK and across the world. It is a big sort of mm. problem that we don't collect that type of data that type of evidence if we knew that we'd know far more about how people manage on those treatments and for how long so it'd be really important to find that out even though we haven't got it written down we know at breast cancer now that we speak to an awful lot of people who are doing well on treatments and have been on them for quite significant periods of time it's not going to be possible to be able to say to an individual, this is how long it will last or it won't last. So for some people, and we speak to those people regularly at Breast Cancer Now, they're only on their treatment a matter of months, if if that. But for others, they're on their treatment for a matter of years. And that's 
a big part of secondary breast cancer and living with that uncertainty and waiting for those scans to come around to find out whether there's been any progression or having new symptoms that might be a sign of progression. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about signs and symptoms of secondary breast cancer after primary breast cancer, but it's also important for the similar sorts of symptoms, if not the same symptoms, to be known by those who've got a diagnosis of secondary breast cancer. So you can tell your nurses if you've got one, if you tell your doctors that you've got some new symptoms that might be a sign of progression as well. So, yeah. so lots of people on different treatments. And the more we sort of go forward, the more people are sort of managing to tolerate and and are doing well. And that those treatments are keeping their cancer under their secondary breast cancer under control. But it will differ widely from person to person. Absolutely. And as you said, you know, palbocyclob and there are a lot of other drugs and treatments now that are quite new. So we don't have all of that data yet, do we? So, yeah, you know, it's, it's still ongoing. Yeah. Is... And I think there's been a change, really. I'm not my research is not my sort of forte, but I know that there's a change recently to be able to try collect what they call the overall survival data, thinking whether a drug as part of you know a, a line of drugs has actually made a difference to the overall even though you had to stop taking it because your cancer's progressed whether actually that made a difference to the overall survival so yeah. I, that again is more data that we need to be able to to collect but there are definitely people out there doing well on different treatments yeah thank you Catherine um just trying to keep up with everything else, all these other questions that have come through um so Jackie has asked, going back to, we were talking a, a few minutes ago about secondaries in the brain, and she's asking about what the treatment would be if you were to develop secondaries in the brain. Mm. This has changed quite substantially, really, in the time that I've been in my role at second, uh, as a secondary breast cancer clinical nurse specialist at Breast Cancer Now and Breast Cancer Care beforehand, because once upon a time when, when people had brain metastases, then that would mean really that they had limited choice of, of, of treatment or there was limited options uh, and that made a difference to their you know overall survival but these days there is quite a bit that can be offered in the form of radiotherapy so um, when people have isolated brain metastases or a low volume or a low number, then experts, so the, the radio, sorry, the um, oncologists um, out there will often prescribe targeted radiotherapy. So stereotactic radiosurgery, you might hear it called stereotactic radiotherapy. And that's made a big, big difference. We're also starting to see some drugs that seem to work better, even though that they are given systemically. So they are going through the blood system that might actually be getting into the brain as well. So one, one that comes to mind most recently, I think, is tocatinib, which is a HER2 positive, um, HER2 directed therapy. So things like that are making a difference. But radiotherapy has definitely made a difference. And that now we're speaking to people who've had brain metastases treated um, and they've got, you know, they're, they're still doing well, you know, a couple of years or more afterwards. Mm -hmm. So much longer periods of time, people are doing much better for so quite a bit of change but it does tend Jackie to be local therapies every so and uh, every so often we speak to people who've had surgery as well that's not really desperately common but it is there with a possibility depending on your situation yeah and again it's individualized isn't it so yeah. it would depend yeah. very much yeah. on depend on the situation yeah, yeah. um I think we're sort of coming to the end of questions now. There might be some more that have been sort of gone through and I've sort of lost them now. But if they have, then we will answer them again. Um, we can answer them tomorrow, can't we, Catherine? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. But I think the last, the final question that I was going to ask you um, that's come through is from Lauren. Um, and it's a nice question, actually. It's um, how, how do we support, how, how can she support a friend? who has been diagnosed with secondary breast cancer. Oh, Lauren, mm. I think you're a lovely friend already for asking that question, yeah. to be honest. So um, it's something that just come through when we get emails. People often ask us about supporting somebody with breast cancer, but secondary breast cancer as well. Um, and I've been asked it on the phone. And I've got a feeling that we've been asked that on Facebook Live before as well. I think... Um, from what I hear, and there's no way of me dictating as to what you what you need to be to a friend, but is is you know listening to what and asking them what they need from you. So many people that we talk to just either don't know what they need or think I don't need people fussing around me or I don't need this or I don't need that. And actually, I would help with really need things with practical things. But I would say, be there, 
and be there to to listen to them and not necessarily listen to sort of give an answer and give a solution but just to hear um last week uh, we did a facebook live with Gemma Gemma who was talking about managing emotions when she's got so a younger woman with secondary breast cancer and she specifically talked about sort of what was helpful with friends and particularly her husband had you know that acknowledgement of how she was feeling I think she'd said I feel really angry and he said to her I'm not surprised you feel you're entitled to feel yeah. angry and that she said that made such a difference so it's those sorts of things being there being given permission as well yeah, isn't it, to listening express yourself, and acknowledging yeah. how people are and mm. yeah sometimes it is easy to say what do you need from me do you need from me to listen do you need for me to be the friend that you go out with a coffee that we don't talk cancer about so because there's you know people don't want to be defined by their secondary breast cancer so that we can have cancer free time together mm. do you need practical stuff do you need me to pick the kids up from school or take you to your appointment or do you need a shepherd's pie leaving on the front doorstep you know or or whatever um and talking about so I think there's a mixture of stuff Lauren I would say that you know there are several younger women that have said actually that you know the they get the best out of their friends and sometimes it's not always the people that they expect to be they're you know sort of being there and doing things for them but just asking and talking about what you can do for that friend um i'm sure will will give you some direction everybody is different but the fact that you've asked the question is amazing and i'm sure you know whoever it is that you're supporting will really value your friendship and your support Absolutely. And also, Lauren, if you if you wanted to support yourself, because it can be difficult supporting friends going through, you know, going through treatment and diagnosis like that, then we're here for you as well. So absolutely. Absolutely. So we speak to not only people that have got secondary breast cancer or primary breast cancer, or maybe they've got a breast um, health concern, they've got pain, they've got a lump, they've got a mm -hmm. symptom. But we do talk to mums and dads and, you know, sort of siblings and colleagues Partners, and friends. Yeah. And yeah. yeah all sorts of things so anybody that is affected by breast cancer including you Lauren absolutely agree with Katie you can give us a ring and have a chat to us on the helpline as well thank okay. you thank you Catherine um I, I'm sure that as I said there were a couple of questions that have, 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 have scrolled up already so I've missed them so I apologize for that but um um, I think we've answered quite a few today. We have we? answered quite a few. And um, as we keep saying, then we will um, set to and have a look at the, the others tomorrow and do a written, a short written response. But if anybody does want to call us on the helpline, then we're open from nine o'clock tomorrow. Um, you can leave a voicemail message. So if you think I'd rather somebody give me a call, then you could ring this evening. Um, you'll get a voicemail message that says, please leave your name and your number. And you can do that and we will call you back as soon as we possibly can uh, tomorrow. So you can always do that um, as well. So uh, thank you for joining me, Katie. Thank you. And, and asking thank those you. questions. Um, sorry to those people that we've missed out on, but as we say that we'll, we'll get to those tomorrow and um, we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future. Um, and I hope that you take good care of yourselves and have a good evening, everybody. Okay, thanks, Katie. Bye. Take care, bye-bye.